Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. We're very excited that you decided to join us today. It is something else. When we study this book, it is amazing. It's an excellent book. Some of the people to help us put together what we're going to study today is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today we're going to be talking about King Sennacherib of Assyria and how he records his attack against King Hezekiah. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. And you've studied today mm -hmm. to find out what's going on. Yes. What's going on? We're going to talk about Isaiah chapter 37, verse 16. All right, a specific verse, 37, mm -hmm. 16. Write it down and get ready for it. And Ryan is here with something interesting. Ryan? Today I'm talking about the Big Bang Theory's big three evidences, allegedly. All right, alleged evidences. Very good. All of this and more coming your way. Plus, later on in the program, I'm going to be teaching on this. When we show off what God has given us, it is nothing less than absolute Pride. We need to be careful of that because pride is a sin. And so we're going to study that and much more as we carry on. reading today, the prophet Isaiah records his perspective of the attack of Sennacherib on Hezekiah. Now, Sennacherib also had recorded his perspective on this attack, and it's now housed in the British Museum. Take a look. The Bible records the military campaign that King Sennacherib of Assyria carried out against Judah. Sennacherib's invasion of Judah destruction of Lachish, and the besieging of Jerusalem that traps King Hezekiah inside. The Bible is not the only document to record these events. There have been four clay cylinders and three clay prisms found buried in the foundation of Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh. He had them written less than a year after his conquest of Judah, and then buried for future generations to uncover. The prisms end with a request from Sennacherib. In future days, when this palace grows old and falls into ruins, may some future prince repair its ruined parts. May he take notice of my name. Sennacherib's effort to secure a lasting name has had pleasant side effects for us today. The rest of the text is stunning. It records, Hezekiah of Judah would not bow down to me. Forty-six of his strongholds, all walled cities, as well as innumerable smaller towns in his territory, were taken. My men brought up siege engines, raised them to the ground with battering rams, attacked and took them by storm. The king himself was holed up in his royal city, caught like a bird in a cage. The glory of my greatness overwhelmed Hezekiah in his terror. In the end, he had to submit to my yoke and pay me tribute. What Sennacherib does not say is important. Sennacherib never claims to have destroyed Jerusalem. In fact, he has his palace walls decorated with scenes of destruction from Judah's number two city, Lachish. The Bible and Sennacherib agree. The land of Judah was devastated, Hezekiah humiliated. But Jerusalem was not lost. And it's not just this prism of Sennacherib, this Taylor prism as it's commonly called today, that uh, has bearing on uh, the, the reliability of the Bible's account here when it records this invasion of Sennacherib. Um, the Sennacherib's palace uh, was excavated in the city of Nineveh. Now, in this palace, he decorated uh, his uh, different rooms on the way to his throne room with scenes from various battles. Now, in one grand room, he decorated it with scenes of destruction from the city of Lachish. Now, remember, uh, this city, Lachish, is mentioned in the Bible as a place where the king of Assyria was and 
he was sending messengers back and forth from Jerusalem to Lachish. And Lachish was destroyed. It was one of Judah's main uh, military centers, and it was a last stand against any invading army before they could get to Jerusalem. Now, at the British Museum, if you visit there today, they have actually reconstructed this room with, sea, with uh, panels from the palace of King Sennacherib, originally found in Nineveh. Uh, and they are called the Lachish panels, the Lachish reliefs. And it's, it's ancient carvings of what the scene of destruction looked like. So we have uh, this biblical city, uh, these biblical carvings uh, from a king of Assyria, and it's lining up with the history that we read in the Bible. Men in leadership often forget their responsibilities and lean on their own ideas to develop something for their children and or their family. But God is the God of provision and eternity. He lives even when we don't. His time is not limited as ours is. We are mortal, God is eternal. And although we have eternity given as a gift from Jesus Christ, we must remember that the limit of our work on earth is true. We must do our work so that God can do what He desires for the future. Now, when we think of developing something for God's future, we would do well to refocus our thinking to His desires for His future. It's difficult to think in these terms, but it's necessary. If we are to adjust our working and thinking to God's ways, then let's focus on that today. Isaiah 39 verses 1 through 8. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord and they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, At least there will be peace and truth in my days. Isaiah chapter 39 verses 1 through 8. Isaiah is an amazing prophet, and he's a man who speaks to people. And many people make the mistake of reading the book of Isaiah and thinking that this is not for me today, this is for the ancient people. But actually, the prophet Isaiah speaks to us today. In fact, his scripture is more relevant now than it has ever been. So what is he saying to us? 
We have to listen and we have to discover and find out. And if you have the Bible guide, you're reading with us and through the Bible with us, we're into this prophet Isaiah, which is amazing. And if you want to get the Bible guide, send an offering in any amount to the American address or send an offering in any amount to the Canadian address or go online at www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's biblediscoverytv.com and give an offering there and it'll take you right to the PDF pages. You'll love it. Today, in Steps of Faith, when we look at this, we need to ask the question, who's in control of the world? Well, God is in control of the world according to the Scripture. If God is in control, then how come things are going crazy? There's shootings in Orlando and all kinds of things happening. And it seems like everything's going crazy and we have to take control. That's what it seems like. But actually, there's a side to this that we need to look at. We read Isaiah 37 to 39, very important. And we're going to keep up in the Bible by going through that. We're looking at Isaiah 39, verses 1 through 8. And as we understand what the Bible says, we're going to slow it down for you. And it says this in Isaiah chapter 39. At that time, Murdoch Bahaladan, the son of Bahaladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. Now this is important, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of treasures, the silver. He showed them the gold, the spices and the precious ointments and all his army and all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all of his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to the king Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, Well, they came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered him, They have seen all that is in my house. For there is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Now this is stunning and amazing. When we show off what God has given us, when we show off what God has given us, it is pride. We must not count our blessings in front of others. There is a song that said, count your blessings, count them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Remember that? But the answer to that question is we are not to do that. We are not to count our blessings in front of people, but we need to remember and say, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you have given me. Now there's testimonies, and we can tell testimonies of how God is faithful and all of that, but we don't need to bloat our blessings in front of everybody because God is going to take offense to that. And there's something very important we need to discover. Verse 5 says, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, all that is in your house, and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons, who will descend from you, who you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the kings of Babylon. Now this is really important, you see, because when we show off what God has given us, our Lord often has plans we do not like that rule our future. This is something that we need to understand. And I can tell you, I can mention people, and all I need to do is tell them your name or tell them tell you their name and you would understand what I'm talking about if we do things wrong then everybody will find out and that's very important beloved we need to consider that God has given us all the things we need we need to consider God has made us well God has done it and we need to make sure that we thank the Lord and we exist in this world but we are not part of this world and we love the people in this world and win people to Christ. And that's our main focus. But our focus is not to become rich so we can become rich. Our focus is to simply understand where the people are and tell them about Jesus Christ. That is so important. May we remember that today. Because look at what Hezekiah did. 
he learned from this. In verse 8, he said, So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, At least there will be peace and truth in my days. Now that brings me to this point, which is really important. We must hear God when God speaks to us. Our failures help those who come after us. Now, Hezekiah was healed of this sickness, and he had 15 more years. And he would have other sons. You know, Manasseh was one of them who took over and did all the evil. But it's important that we understand we don't take what God gives us and boast about it. Make it a big deal. Well, see what God has given me? Stop that. Don't do that. Because we need to understand that the Lord has given to us for a reason. And there are good reasons that sometimes God just loves us and he wants to give us things. Not so we can go around and brag and tell everybody. No, no. It's so that we understand that he loves us. Not that we have, but he loves us. It's very important that we hear that, especially today. As we continue to study through the books of the prophets now, that's the section where we are in the Old Testament of the Bible, I want to take a moment to actually look at this role of the prophet during the time period of the kings of Israel and Judah. The historical records of Israel's kings give an overview of how many prophets or seers were functioning during the days of the monarchy. Many readers are surprised at the source references in Chronicles that list books recording events and reigns of the kings written by prophets. In the days of King David, there are two prominent prophets. The first is Nathan, who confronted David on a few occasions and wrote a history entitled The Events of Nathan the Prophet. The second is Gad the Seer, who is also credited with writing a book about David's reign. The lifetimes of Rehoboam, David's grandson who split the nation, and Jeroboam who was chosen to rule the north were heavily influenced by prophets. Edo, the seer, wrote his visions and their history. There are two unnamed prophets in 1 Kings 13. Shemaiah the prophet warns Rehoboam about invasions, and Ahijah the Shilonite also prophesied and wrote. Throughout the remaining king's reigns appear prophets like Azariah, the son of Oded, Hanani, the seer, Hanani's son, Jehu, Micaiah, son of Imla, Eleazar, son of Dadavanhu, famous Elijah and Elisha, along with 100 unnamed prophets saved from Jezebel, and Oded, the prophet, who saved Judah from enslavement by Israel. There are prophets whose whole books are in the Bible. Jonah, Zephaniah, and Amos prophesied during the days of Jeroboam II of Israel and Uzziah of Judah, along with Isaiah and Hosea. After their time came Micah, then Nahum. The prophet Jeremiah ministered around the time of the destruction of Judah by Babylon, followed closely by Habakkuk. These books accurately represent history and give examples of what the lost book of the prophets probably looked like. We just want to say thank you to our partners who've helped us all get this far and continue to do so. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. This month, we are making it possible for you to own your own copy of Ryan Hembry's Studies into Space, a DVD collection of over 30 of Ryan's quick study television segments. The DVD is entitled Cosmic Mysteries Discovering a Universe by Design, Segment Library, Volume 1. In this first volume, Ryan explores astronomical discoveries from a biblical perspective. Have you ever wondered if the stars can help us understand certain events in the Bible or how they play a part in the creation evolution debate? Ryan has wondered and investigated. Now his studies are available on more than just the daily program. 
Our hope is that these segments will be an encouragement to your faith and a way for you to dig deeper into your studies of the Bible. To get your copy, call or write us with a suggested donation of $25 or more. And be sure to ask for your copy of Cosmic Mysteries, Discovering a Universe by Design. Thank you for staying with us as we continue to go through the Bible. Very, very interesting. And next time on Quick Study Television, I'm going to be talking about the following. Jesus Christ brings justice to the Gentiles. What in the world am I talking about? Well, you'll find out next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, Ryan is here, right? Over the last several weeks, we've examined the Big Bang Theory and discovered that it is really a theory in trouble. However, despite its countless problems, many cosmologists still believe that the Big Bang is the correct cosmology. And when asked why they believe this, they usually put forward three big evidences. First, universal expansion. Second, the abundance of the light elements. And third, the cosmic background radiation. But are these really good proofs? Let's study. It was the 20th century American astronomer Edwin Hubble who first promoted the idea of an expanding universe. Today, this is almost unanimously accepted by both creationists and evolutionists. In fact, evolutionists often use the expanding universe as one of the major proofs for the Big Bang Theory. However, this is backwards since universal expansion was already known about before the development of the Big Bang. Indeed, the Big Bang was constructed around the expansion and therefore explains it, but does not predict it. However, many different models could be constructed to explain universal expansion besides the Big Bang. For example, for a creationist, one possible interpretation of the universal expansion could come from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. This Bible passage states that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Interestingly, in the original Hebrew, this statement does not appear to be in the present tense, but rather in the past. Therefore, based on this, some creationists believe that the Bible here is actually referring to a stretching out or expansion of the heavens during the initial creation week. If this is the case, it provides an interesting solution for the light travel time problem. The light travel time problem is this. If the universe is only thousands of years old, as a plain reading of scripture indicates, then how are we seeing light from stars, galaxies, and other objects many hundreds of thousands of light years away? Indeed, light from these distant objects would take much longer than thousands of years to reach the Earth. Over the years, there have been a number of credible theories about getting the distant light to the Earth in a short amount of time. However, if God did stretch out the heavens during the creation week, then the light from the stars and galaxies would also have stretched out. This would mean the light was already visible by the time God created man. Based on this, it is conceivable that the expansion of the universe we are now observing is actually a remnant of this initial stretching. This remnant expansion is also clearly purposeful in design, since if the universe were static, gravity would slowly pull the universe inward, causing a universal collapse. Universal expansion, therefore, actually shows evidence not for an unorchestrated Big Bang event, but rather for a highly designed and ordered creation by a supremely wise and intelligent creator. So the first big proof of the Big Bang Theory, the universal expansion, isn't proof at all since the Big Bang was developed around the already known expansion. And as I said in this segment, the expansion of the universe is actually evidence for an intelligent creator since the expansion rate is balanced perfectly with the force of gravity. It's actually so precise that any slight change in these values means either the universe collapses upon itself or expands too fast with its density ever decreasing. We'll talk about the other two alleged proofs of the Big Bang Theory next week. Very interesting. I love these Big Bang segments. They're excellent. Excellent, <laughs> Ryan. Uh, now, you studied. What did you put together? Well, we're taking a look at Isaiah 37. And, of course, if we back it up to Isaiah 36, we realize that Sennacherib, who is the king of Assyria, is boasting against the Lord. And it's really a, 
a setup um, that's really trying to play with the minds of Hezekiah and his people. And they're talking about how that the other nations and their gods have been completely taken away by Assyria. And so how does Hezekiah think that his God is going to be able to not be defeated? And when we come into uh, chapter 37, Sennacherib brings a threat and Hezekiah goes to the sanctuary spreads out the letter and delivers a prayer to the Lord. Now, keep in mind that Sennacherib has been trying to discredit the God of Israel, the God of Hezekiah, and putting him into the same category as the so-called gods of the nations that have been defeated. Listen to the first part of Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdom of, kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. I'm telling you, that is what we need to do in our lives. We need to address the Lord God as the Lord. He is the King of Kings. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who brings redemption and healing to our lives. He's the one that we call out to. The Lord does not let us gloat about our wealth or our success. We must understand that the words of 1 Timothy 6 speak to the church. If we are blessed by God, we must not lean on those blessings too much. We are to understand that God expects us to be more sensitive to those who have less than those who have as much or more. As God gives us what we need to help others, our life takes on new meaning and purpose. At the end of the program, I always love these times when we can talk just for a moment to let you know that God is involved in your life, that God wants to save you, but you must decide. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, and he rose again on the third day. And he said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today and say to him, Lord, be my Lord. Help me now. 